what questions people are interested in. And then if you see a question you like, you can kind of give it a thumbs up or something. Uh, and the more people that kind of give it that, that rating, it will move up along the list and we'll make sure we get it answered. I don't have any disclosures. Obviously, this is a medical device, but I have no affiliation with the, the company. So we'll see if anybody has any questions here. I'll give it a minute um, and the questions should start popping up here. Uh, if no questions uh, come up immediately, then we'll just get going. All right, so the first thing I want to do is just make sure the platform is working okay. So uh, enter your, your level of training. And let's see if this is working. All right, we'll see if more people join as time goes on. So next question is, have, have you reviewed the AUA, SUFU, incontinence after prostate treatment guidelines? And, and if so, how familiar are you with the, with the guideline? I think that's probably what I expected, especially with residents who are regularly reviewing guidelines, but maybe have a hard time retaining all the information. So next is just, kind of a gauge experience on AUS. How many AUS surgeries have you participated in? All right, that's actually a perfect breakdown. So we have uh, some, at least an expert in the crowd. Uh, and then we have some novices, which is, which is perfect for this talk. All right, so this is the device that we're gonna talk about, and it's the AMS 800 urinary control system. So just some basic questions, just to see how familiar you guys are, the residents. How many connections do you have to make when you're placing an AUS? All right, great. So as you can see, the AUS is a three piece uh, device. You have a uh, pump and uh, the pump has two tubings that come off. And then the other two components, the pressure regulating balloon, which we'll talk about a little bit, and the cuff uh, each need to be connected to the pump. So there are two connections, as you can see here. So what's the most common pressure regulating balloon used in standard AUS surgery? Okay, great. So 61 to 70 is the most common uh, pressure regulating balloon. This is the pressure regulating balloon here. And uh, the balloon has an intrinsic quality to it, an intrinsic elasticity that when filled appropriately to the appropriate volume, it's going to exert that amount of pressure, 61 to 70 centimeters of water on this system. And we'll see why that's important in just a minute. Now, if you notice, the pressure regulating balloon looks different than the rest of the modern artificial urinary sphincter here in that it's clear, whereas the rest of the device is yellow. So why is the pressure regulating balloon clear and the other components are yellow? All right, this is a pessimistic crowd. I like it. So 
the correct answer is that the pressure regulating balloon cannot be impregnated with the antibiotics while the pump and the cuff can. So uh, the company has created a, a product that includes minocycline and rifampin. And uh, those two components, the cuff and the pump, uh, can be impregnated. But I think it has to do with the, the pressure regulating balloon being very thin not being able to stand up to the heat required for uh, treating it with the antibiotic. Uh, but I could be wrong there. But the idea is that the pressure regulating balloon cannot be treated and that's why it remains clear. So what is the significance of using that antibiotic impregnation or coating? And um, well, it's really pretty limited. The average revision rate due to infection in, in around 25,000 patients was about 1.4%. The patients that uh, had a device with that, with that antibiotic coating had a rate of 1.3 versus the non-coated devices 1.6. They quote about an 18% uh, relative risk to, uh, reduction, but you can see absolute, it's quite, uh, quite slim. So the next question I have for everybody is how do you deactivate an AMS 800? This is something that comes up for residents all the time on the floor, and we'll talk about a patient later. So that's great. So, uh, so everyone got that right. So you squeeze the pump, um, and that's to empty the cuff, because you want the cuff to be empty uh, so the urethra is open. Then you wait for the pump to partially refill and to press the deactivation button. And I won't belabor this since everybody got it right, um, but we'll talk about it in a second. So let's talk a little bit about how this pump works because that's the most sophisticated part of this device. Uh, and, and here's the idea. So when the patient needs to void, they're gonna squeeze the pump bulb. That's gonna remove fluid from the cuff, which is over here, and push it into the pressure regulating balloon. So when that happens, the, the fluid is moving through uh, two interesting areas. This is a little ball valve, and then this is called the deactivation valve poppet. And you can see that there's a little lump right here, and this is the deactivation button. So when the deactivation button is pressed, it moves this poppet down into the locked position. So that way, fluid can't return from the pressure regulating balloon. And we'll talk about that in just a second with the next picture. So storing. So when it's time for the cuff to fill again to close the urethra, the pressure regulating balloon is gonna deliver fluid back through this resistor. The resistor is really important. This is why the cuff doesn't immediately fill back up after the patient uh, pumps the, the bulb. So the pressure regulating balloon is exerting 61 to 70 centimeters of water pressure going through this activated poppet. And that fluid has to travel through the resistor to get back to the cuff. It's not that the cuff doesn't start refilling for two minutes or one minute or whatever. It's that it takes a long time for that fluid to go through the resistor back into the cuff. And that's important. So I don't see that anybody has any questions so far, which is good for me, I guess, but hopefully people are getting their questions answered. So let's go through the guideline for incontinence after prostate uh, treatment. And this guideline was put forth by the AUA and, and SUFU, and it was created in 2018 uh, and published in 2019. And you can see uh, the, the staff that put it together, the committee that put it together here. So the index patient is a 66-year-old male with urinary incontinence six months after prostatectomy. The patient's been doing pelvic floor muscle training and pelvic floor muscle exercises since the catheter was removed. So the question is, what's the earliest in months you'd place an AUS after prostatectomy? And let's see uh, what people respond. 
So that's great. So those are the two important answers. So the first guideline statement that we really want to review is that pelvic floor muscle uh, exercises and pelvic floor muscle training should start early after prostatectomy, really right after the catheter comes out. And it's not that the pelvic floor therapy is going to improve overall continence in patients. It's not going to increase the likelihood of them becoming continent, but it is likely to improve the time to continent. So overall quality of life will be improved because they'll return to continence if that's where they're destined to be earlier. So with respect to the timing of AUS placement, so the guideline says surgery may be considered at six months if incontinent isn't improving. And the idea here is that in almost all patients, over 90% of patients, their continence improvement really plateaus earlier than one year. So if a patient has severe incontinence at six months, they're not really likely to become continent. They might improve a little bit, but they're not likely to become completely continent and thus artificial urinary sphincter would be appropriate in that patient as early as six months. Surgery should be offered at one year for patients with bothersome incontinence. And the idea here is that very few patients actually improve their continence function after one year. So if the patient is bothered at a year, that's the appropriate time to place an AUS. So both six and 12 were correct answers in their own way. So our index patient, again, now it's uh, 12 months after prostatectomy, still has bothersome urinary incontinence, has been doing the pelvic floor physical therapy uh, since the catheter was removed, and the patient was referred for surgical intervention. So what workup would you uh, perform for this patient prior to moving towards surgery? What's something that's, that's uh, of value to you in, in preoperative evaluation? All right, so preoperative evaluation of patients for AUS. The history is important in these patients, uh, and the guideline states that you want to identify urge, you want to identify history of radiation, you want to look at pad size, the number of pads used, and the degree of wetness. And they say that, that those three factors, pad size, number of pads, and degree of wetness, correlate very well with 24-hour pad weights, and there's not a clear advantage to doing the 24-hour pad weight. The reason urge really needs to be identified is because that would be treated before you would treat their stress component uh, based on the OAB uh, guidelines. And I want everybody to know that uh, I've underlined any statement that's one of the guideline statements here uh, throughout this entire talk. Physical exam is really important. The guideline wants you to demonstrate stress urinary incontinence on exam, and that can be with provocative testing or not. I put PVR here, that's not explicitly uh, in the guideline, but I think there is value because that can help identify people that are uh, not only incontinent, but also potentially in retention. Cystoscopy should be performed, and that's a guideline statement. Uh, you, wanted, you wanna perform cystoscopy basically to rule out findings that would impact your surgical plan. So that could be a bladder tumor, a vesicourethral mastomotic stenosis, or in the case of a TERP, a bladder neck contracture. Also, uh, there's this idea that you would uh, use cystoscopy for considerations for sling versus AUS, and we'll talk about that in a second. That's a bit controversial. It is acceptable to perform the cystoscopy intraoperatively prior to the incision. The guideline doesn't say that, uh, that, but that that's inappropriate. They say that that's appropriate. Your dynamics can be performed if the diagnosis is unclear or if it may change the management, but it's not necessary in this index patient. So anybody who does a lot of implants, when do you per perform the cystoscopy? Do you do it preoperatively in the clinic uh, or do you do it intraoperatively before you make the incision? 
So I think that's pretty consistent. Uh, most people perform cystoscopy up front uh, because they don't want to do the counseling of the, the artificial sphincter and also the counseling about uh, bladder neck incision or incision of a, of a sten uh, posterior urethral stenosis. So when we talk about sling versus AUS, this is a complicated discussion and probably too much for the purposes of this talk because we're mostly talking about AUS, but I think the most important thing is patient factors, the patient's values and expectations. They, they refer to this as shared decision making uh, in the guideline. The idea that uh, if the patient doesn't want uh, a mechanical device that they have to pump each time they void, then it, it really doesn't it doesn't matter the degree of incontinence or the cystoscopic findings or, or their history. It, re it really doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to put an artificial sphincter in them. But when making the decision AUS versus sling, the guideline does state that uh, an AUS can be used in a patient with any severity of incontinence, whereas the sling is really indicated for patients with mild to moderate uh, uh, incontinence. And they go as far as to say, you should not be routinely placing slings for patients with severe incontinence, but they do leave the door open a little bit to place slings for patients with severe incontinence or radiated patients uh, if appropriately counseled. So what about cystoscopy findings? So there are providers who will use findings on cystoscopy like coaptation or, or uh, the patient's ability to coapt uh, their, their uh, pelvic floor and their urethra uh, as a positive indicator for their success of sling. The guideline basically states that there's not enough evidence uh, to suggest that that improves outcomes enough to put it in the guideline. And really the same with UDS. So some, some uh, uh, surgeons will use Valsalva leak point pressure as an indication of uh, success with sling, and there's just not enough evidence to support that enough to place in a guideline. They do state, though, that if there's a history of radiation, AUS is preferred, and if there's a history of prior incontinence surgery, then AUS is, re is really recommended, sling or artificial sphincter uh, previously. So back to our patient. Uh, the patient's 12 months after prostatectomy, and the patient elects AUS placement. Uh, so what is the guideline recommended surgical approach for AUS placement? So the guideline actually took a pretty hard stance on this and said that for the approach to the AUS, you really should be placing a single cuff through a perineal approach. And the reason is there's a lot of uh, comparative studies, as you can see below, that uh, are comparing the outcomes of penoscrotally placed AUSs versus perineally approached uh, placements. And they say that the, inc the continence outcomes are inferior, and there's also an increased rate of complications and short-term revisions. And the idea that they cite is that uh, the, the urethra in this critical landing zone for the, for the artificial sphincter is really cone-shaped. So they feel that if you're going penoscrotally, this is a perineal dissection for a urethroplasty. Dr. Nikolovsky was nice enough to give me this image. If you're going penoscrotally, uh, there's probably a tendency to get the cuff a little bit more distally, where the urethra is slightly more narrow. And uh, this could be the reason why uh, incontinence outcomes are worse and why revision rates are higher, as opposed to getting the cuff where it's supposed to be uh, down in the bulb, uh, where uh, perhaps it works a little bit better for continence and is less likely to cause problems in the future. Uh, one study by uh, one of my mentors uh, showed in a multi-center study of around 155 patients uh, split 63 penoscrotal and 92 perineal that the average cuff size uh, was 4 centimeters for penoscrotal versus 4.2 centimeters for perineal. And this doesn't really seem like a lot uh, but that could account for the relatively uh, kind of small difference uh, uh, or worse outcomes with the penoscrotal approach. And that's what they're getting at with uh, more distal placement. 
All right, so you recognize a urethral injury while you're developing a plane between the urethra and the corpora. The accessory tray is already open, the pressure regulating balloon is already open, and the pump are open. They're already prepped on the back table. So when this happens, what's the next step in surgery? All right. So I like most of those answers. So uh, according to the guideline, you need to ab abort the placement of the AUS. Um, now, let's see. Thought I had one more slide here. So uh, you need to abort the placement of the AUS, and the guideline suggests that you leave a catheter. For small defects, they say it's okay to just leave the catheter. Um, for three weeks uh, and then perform either VCUG or retrograde urethrogram to make sure that there's no extravasation uh, and then uh, delay replacement of the, of the artificial sphincter. If it's a large defect, they suggest that there may be a benefit uh, to repairing the urethra. So um, my question is for experts, anybody who places a lot of these, if you were to injure the urethra and um, and you're gonna abort, would you leave a placeholder such as the, the measuring tape uh, so that next time you go in, your, your position is already ready for you? So not particularly controversial in this group, I suppose. Uh, everybody agrees, no placeholder. And I think that's reasonable. All right, so first question, how long does it take for the device to cycle? Okay, so let me, let me answer that question the next time our little picture of our device comes up and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. So I'll make sure I get that question answered. Okay, some AUS related scenarios for residents on the floor or residents taking call uh, in the ER. So this is a 76 year old male with an artificial sphincter. He's admitted to the MICU and he requires bladder drainage for whatever reason. The uh, device deactivation alone is not adequate. So the device is already deactivated, but, but really the, the patient needs, needs bladder drainage. So what's your next step, residents? What are you gonna do in this patient? So for anybody in the audience who's an attending, who's going to back up the resident on this, uh, what do you do? Do you place a small Foley for as long as it's needed, 12 French or something? Place a small Foley, but replace it with a suprapubic tube within three days. Place a suprapubic tube immediately. Go to CIC, other, or uh, buccal mucosal graft. Just to check if Nikolovsky's paying attention. So I tend to agree uh, with this. I, I like to, to place a 12 French Foley and if the patient can kind of move on from this issue quickly and we can get the Foley out, that's fine. But if not, we're gonna request uh, a super pubic tube to be placed uh, within a few days. 
So I guess if the patient um, is, is clearly going to need drainage long term, then an SB tube up front is reasonable. I would certainly avoid clean intermittent catheterization in a patient with a cuff. Uh, and then I like how a few responders in the resident group said to make sure that the cuff is deactivated. And I would add that if you, if you place a Foley and it's going to be in for a few days, make sure somebody's checking regularly to make sure that that cuff is still deactivated. Uh, anybody who's dealt with these erosions due to Foley catheters um, know that, that it does happen and it does happen pretty quickly. All right, so second patient's a 65-year-old male with an AUS placed six weeks ago who returns to the clinic for activation. On palpation of the device, the pump is completely collapsed and cannot be depressed to activate. So what do you do when this happens for the residents? You can't, you can't just squeeze the bulb to get the thing to activate. What are, what's the next step? So this lack of response actually kind of makes sense to me. I don't think people really know what to do in this circumstance. So hopefully whoever's watching is learning something. So uh, here's the idea. And then I'll answer that other question for how long does it take the device to cycle? So, so uh, what, what has happened is the, in order for the device to be reactivated, you have to force fluid from the pump bulb through here and you have to pop this deactivation valve out. So this deactivation po uh, valve pop it is pressed down into this groove so that no fluid from the PRB can go back this way through to the cuff. So if you have fluid here and you press it firmly, you're gonna push fluid through here and the resistor is enough that the fluid's gonna wanna go this direction. And you're gonna pop this pop it open and that's gonna activate the device. But if you have no fluid in here to force through, you can't do this. So there's a couple different things you can do, but the, the main one is you basically squeeze the device on the side. So in this picture over here, it's into the plane of the, of the screen. Uh, and what you're trying to do is just allow enough fluid to return from the PRB back into the pump. And then once there's enough fluid in here, then you can activate it normally, okay? And I think the way that this works is you just create enough space here that then fluid can come through, go through the resistor and ultimately equilibrate between the cuff and the pump. And this takes time, all right? And so that kind of gets to the next question, which is how long does it take the device to cycle? And I think the simple answer is it depends. It depends on what you fill the device with. And that's a one of our quiz questions later. But basically, uh, the fluid from the PRB has to get back through the resistor and back into the cuff. So that's gonna be a little bit dependent on the viscosity of the fluid. Um, it's gonna be dependent on the pressure in the pressure regulating balloon, and it's gonna be uh, the volume of the cuff. But on average, I think it's somewhere between one to two minutes. All right, so patient number three, uh, patient number three has hematuria, okay? It's a 75-year-old man with an artificial sphincter, and he had it placed after he had a TERP and radiation therapy. Uh, either, either one could have been first, but they were both over 10 years ago. And he presents with incontinence, with hematuria, and clots. So what are you worried about in a, in a patient who's post-radiation therapy who presents with hematuria and incontinence? Perfect. Two most relevant answers. So uh, erosion is what needs to be ruled out uh, kind of for immediate surgical need. And radiation cystitis, which would require clot evacuation through your AUS, is probably the second thing worrying you. 
So those are both great answers. So I, I was going with uh, a patient who has um, uh, radiation cystitis and, and clot retention with an artificial sphincter in place because this is painful uh, to, to deal with. I'd probably rather they had an erosion. So, um, so you do a cystoscopy and really you want to rule out erosion. That's why you're doing it. Uh, the patient has been irradiated and there's a higher incidence of erosion in, in irradiated patients and erosion often presents with hematuria. You got to evaluate for clot retention one way or another. Something you probably do in clinic is going to give you a hint, maybe just physical exam with a distended bladder, maybe a bladder scan. Maybe you have an ultrasound or CT because the patient's in the ER and you're going to make that diagnosis. So, uh, the patients are a little bit different if they have uh, clot retention or they don't. So, a patient that has radiation cystitis uh, and does not have clot retention, we've managed pretty minimally invasively. Uh, just deactivate them, let them leak, uh, maybe flexible cystoscopy with fulguration, and just try to get them to hyperbaric oxygen because once it happens once, you know it's going to keep happening. Um, if they have clot retention, this becomes much more challenging. So you could consider percutaneous clot evacuation with an SB2 placement and then run CBI, potentially even putting a small catheter through the AUS for a period if you want to run through and through CBI. You can make a perineal incision and you can uncouple the cuff so that you can get your, your resectoscope uh, through the urethra and then per perform clot evacuation and fulguration uh, and then go back in and, and re replace the cuff at the end of the procedure. Um, but again, moving towards hyperbaric oxygen just to try to prevent this in the future. So anybody who's had one of these patients, and hopefully I'm not the only person, uh, how have you managed these patients in the past? That's great news that I'm the only one in central New York getting these patients. NEF2 is called Dr. Blakely. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, all right. Nephrostomy tubes is also reasonable. Um, and then and then what do you do with the clots after that if you if you can respond again? Let the bladder clot off. Might be the best option. All right, so what, what, what else do we have? All right, we've answered that question. Uh, what if the patient changes the mind after unexpected urethral injury? Now you have a foreign body to fetch. That's a good, good question. That might be a good reason not to do it. I agree. All right, what is the timeline for evaluating for urethral erosion in case patient had unfortunately the wrong plan, larger catheter for longer duration? Okay. Okay, so I think what you're asking is if you have a patient who's in the ICU and needs a catheter and uh, you've left it in for three days and uh, then maybe it came out five days instead of three um, and the patient's now better and you're wondering should you do cystoscopy for uh, to rule out erosion. All right, so uh, my answer to that is I've never uh, had an erosion patient that um, with a subtle finding. Uh, it's usually very obvious. So it's usually a patient, um, and we'll have one later, that has a big indurated uh, scrotum and uh, the pump starts trying to come through the skin uh, and they have hematuria, they have either retention or incontinence, um, but it's never been subtle. I don't think I would routinely scope them to see if they had an erosion just because they had a, a catheter in for a longer duration. I think I would let it declare itself. How long before you attempt AUS if a urethral erosion during a urethral? Okay, so I'm assuming this is going to say a urethral injury during the initial surgery. And I think uh, what I would do in a patient who had a urethral injury, I think I would repair it. And then I would uh, probably do a retrograde urethrogram uh, when I took the catheter out. And if that retrograde urethrogram looked good, I would probably scope the patient at about six weeks with the intention of getting them back in the OR at about three months. Uh, that would, that's how I would uh, deal with that patient. All right, those are good questions. Okay, so now moving on to the instructive AUS cases. These are a little bit more complex um, and hopefully um, 
hopefully some people get some something out of this. So first case, 70 year old male history of AUS for incontinence after prostatectomy presents with retention as well as penile and scrotal edema, erythema and induration. So uh, what's the most likely diagnosis here? And I, I think I probably gave it away uh, with one of the answers uh, to the prior question. Yeah, so for a patient who uh, has a urethral erosion, this is a really common presentation. So as you can see in this cystoscopic view, which I got um, from one of my mentors, this is a cuff that's kind of turned sideways on itself and is now obstructing the urethra. So it's not uncommon for patients to present with retention. Uh, but their scrotum is enlarged, it's edematous, it's, um, it's erythematous. There's a lot of induration, sometimes the pump uh, even starts um, kind of migrating through the skin and you can have a skin finding overlying the pump, but the whole device uh, really gets infected and gets inflamed when this happens. And the guidelines very clear. You have to remove all the components. Um, you can place a catheter uh, um, across the, uh, a small defect or you can repair um, a large uh, defect and um, you're thinking about replacing an AUS in, in three to six months. So basically removing the components and delayed uh, replacement of an AUS. So in a patient uh, who has uh, AUS erosion, uh, for anybody who places a lot of these, what do you, what do you, what's your go-to in the future? All right. So here's kind of um, the algorithm I put together for revision for, for an eroded patient. So the first thing is to evaluate for stricture. So if you do a urethral repair, hopefully you won't get a stricture, but you need to do something to check. So like I said, um, have a catheter and you remove it and do a rug, make sure there's no extravasation. Otherwise, you're leaving a catheter for longer. If there's no extravasation, you're going to scope maybe six weeks after that and see if there's any stricture because you're looking to get this patient back into the operating room. So one consideration is checking testosterone. There's at least some evidence that patients with hypogonadism may be at higher, uh, may be at higher risk for erosion. Uh, if you're gonna replace that, you, you have to consider their prostate cancer status. Uh, and then using cystoscopy intraoperatively to identify the location of the prior erosion and seeing if there's a good landing zone for a new cuff. Um, and that's going to be important. So if the patient didn't uh, develop a stricture after uh, they've healed up from their erosion and they've been free of their device, if the original cuff was too distal, if that's why you think they developed the erosion, because whoever placed the prior cuff just got it onto the pendulous urethra or the distal bulb, then recite proximally. If the original cuff was appropriately, uh, appropriately proximal, so where it was supposed to be, you could consider reciting it distally uh, or a transcorporal placement, I think, are the two options. And as you can see, most people here favor transcorporal placement. Uh, you have to counsel a patient that either reciting the cuff distally or using a transcorporal technique may not actually reduce the re-erosion rate. In fact, I think if you reposition it distally, you can almost count on uh, another erosion. Um, and uh, transcorporally, I think, is probably the better, uh, better route. Now, in reality, most of these patients have a lot of uh, 
uh, damaged urethra after this erosion, and they've had a lot of uh, surgery around that area to repair it. Uh, and most of these patients probably are going to end up with a transcorporal cuff. So in a patient who had a stricture uh, or who's found to have a stricture six weeks out, now I'm talking to them about urethroplasty and then delayed replacement. So if the urethroplasty is extensive, which it almost certainly will be, in that case, the, the patients are probably getting a transcorporal placement. Uh, and you're just really going to, you're going to be trying to avoid dorsal dissection here, uh, regardless of whether you do an EPA or uh, some buccal augmentation. Uh, either way, it's going to be really difficult to dissect the urethra off the corpora again and get into a safe plane. If the urethra is devastated after an erosion, maybe this is after several erosions, now you're considering just closing the proximal urethral stump and putting a super pubic tube in for diversion or a urinary diversion surgery if the patient's uh, appropriately motivated for that. So now the case, the second case is a 68-year-old male with a history of artificial sphincter. Uh, for five years, he now has recurrent incontinence. So what's the most likely diagnosis in this patient? So you guys know your SASAP question. So this is a classic SASAP question. Um, and so how do you work this up? So uh, obviously for all patients, history and physical, um, and the physical exam is particularly important here because you wanna try to assess the cuff position, particularly if you weren't the one who placed it. You wanna review the operative report and understand what device the patient has in. Uh, and then you're gonna perform cystoscopy and you might see something like this. When the cuff is supposed to be closed, you can look right through it. So this uh, is usually re referred to as subcuff urethral atrophy or urethral atrophy. Uh, and five years is kind of a common uh, time, uh, timeline for uh, atrophy to show up. There's other ideas uh, about why this happens that maybe it isn't atrophy, maybe it's just degradation of the PRB that the pressure regulating balloon isn't giving that 61 to 70 centimeters of water anymore. It's just not giving enough pressure to fill that cuff enough to co-opt the urethra, or maybe there's a minor fluid loss. And this came out of, uh, of a paper where around 40% of patients, the, the thing didn't seem to be working, but there also didn't seem to be any finding of atrophy at time of, of, uh, of surgery. So for the residents or students, what are some options for managing this patient? And there are a lot of them. So how can you manage a patient who is not infected, not eroded, the, the device just isn't co-opting the urethra because of subcuff atrophy? Tandem cuff, new sphincter, Cunningham penile clamp, tandem cuff, smaller cuff, Cunningham clamp, get rid of the rind, tandem cuff. Okay, very good. All right. So let's hear what experts have to say. So for the experts, I'm going to make it a little bit more specific because I know there's a lot of options. So 68-year-old male, subcuff atrophy, appropriately positioned four centimeter cuff. It's right where you want it. The device is five years old. What's your preferred revision? 
All right. So uh, for this patient, I'm going to talk a little bit about guidelines, and then I'm going to just talk a little bit about what's kind of becoming popular more recently. Uh, so um, for the guideline, they, they have a clear statement that says, in a patient who has recurrent incontinence after AUS, you should offer a revision. And they have a little explanation of what you might do, but that's the basics of the guideline. You should offer revision. You shouldn't abandon the patient's incontinence. All right, so my list of do's and don'ts. So my, my first choice is to excise the pseudocapsule, remeasure, and replace. And in most cases, you're going to replace the same size cuff that was already there. My second choice would be recite more, recite more proximally if it's feasible in this case that I presented, we didn't have that option, but sometimes that's okay. Particularly if on physical exam, you notice that the cuff is a little distal. Or recite distally if you're still in the mid bulb. I don't particularly like this option, uh, but if for some reason you can't do one of the prior two and you need to recite, recite distally, that might be reasonable. So considerations. So you want to consider replacing a component versus the entire device. And most um, most of my mentors choose to replace the whole device if it's older than about three years old, and that sounds arbitrary. Uh, but a, a cuff a device that's five years old, and probably most people are going to replace the whole thing. There is an idea that it's actually cheaper overall to just replace components, um, and that's something I think that should be explored more. Uh, so swapping out the PRB for a 71 to 80, this is popular among some surgeons but they admit that you really have to follow the patient closely uh, with cystoscopy because you can start seeing that that cuff is just squeezing the urethra too tight, uh, which can cause kind of essentially pressure necrosis. Uh, don't. So uh, recently, 3.5 cuff has kind of fallen out of favor uh, and part of, partially because of a, uh, a study that demonstrated that it was an independent risk factor for revision. Uh, the 3.5 centimeter cuff is slightly different uh, in its shape than the 4 centimeter cuff. Uh, it was previously thought that 3.5 centimeter cuff was probably not an independent risk factor. It was probably the radiation that was causing the, the erosions. Uh, but, but more recently, uh, some retrospective uh, research demonstrated that the 3.5 centimeter cuff was more likely to be needed to be revised. So placing a cuff transcorporally. So I already said that I like this technique, but in a patient who has just an original cuff and a lot of other areas on the urethra, uh, I think this is skipping a step. Uh, so I wouldn't go straight to a TC cuff. And then reciting into the distal bulb or pendulous urethra is, is inappropriate uh, uh, because of the problems that we talked about earlier with increased incontinence. Uh, placement of a tandem cuff. It is in the guideline as an option, but it's kind of also fallen out of favor. Uh, there was a nice study that demonstrated that uh, placing a tandem cuff um, probably doesn't change the dynamics within the urethra. The proximal cuff is probably the only one that's really uh, contributing to the patient's continence. All right, so this is a fun case, and this will be the last one, and we're uh, right about on time. So this is a 61-year-old male with a history of brachytherapy, uh, bulbal membranous urethral stricture. After anterior posterior urethroplasty with a dorsal onlay buccal mucosal graft, the patient has stress incontinence. Urodynamic demonstrates a low valsalva leak point pressure and adequate capacity and compliance. So basically, the bladder's okay, and the patient has stress incontinence. It's not urge. Uh, so now you have uh, this patient who had um, near obliteration and now has a nice widely painted urethra, um, but the question is where can you put a cuff and how? And so uh, what would you guys do? Just tell the patient, sorry, you're not a candidate, penile clamp, or just try to wing it with some bulking agent, uh, put a sling in to reposition the urethra where it's supposed to be, uh, AUS just distal to the repair, or a TC. All right, so TC is the right answer based on 
um, on uh, guidelines. Uh, they basically say after urethral reconstruction, it is still okay to place an AUS. Male sling is felt to be not effective. That's the guideline statement. They do say transcorporal placement is probably ap appropriate in most cases after urethroplasty, and I tend to agree. It's really hard to find a good landing zone for artificial sphincter with a normal dissection after the urethra has been mobilized significantly. And in this patient who's already been irradiated and had urethral surgery, I think you're asking for trouble. This is a nice picture of uh, a transcorporal placement. And just to talk about transcorporal placement a little bit before we go. Uh, so this is the normal landing zone for AUS. You can see the crora kind of starting to split here. This is the bulbospongiosis muscle kind of divided and being pulled side to the side. The kind of the crora kind of kind of splitting here, and this is where you want to place your cuff in the nice thick part of the bulb. But a TC cuff you can't place there because the crora are already splitting, so you'll never get that cuff into the uh, corpora uh, around through the septum and out the other corpora in that position. So just uh, the nature of a TC cuff is slightly more distal. I want everybody to kind of understand that. And this is a good picture here. So placement of your normal cuff down here in the bulb where after the crora split, uh, TC cuff is gonna be up here where the, the corpora are still uh, together, uh, where you can make a corporotomy on either side and pass your, pass your, uh, your cuff through the, through the corpora. All right, let's see if we have answered these questions. How would you advise patient with incontinence and history of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer needing serial surveillance cystoscopy? Oh, that's a really good question. All right, I'm gonna pass on that. If a patient is using one, sometimes two pads per day, would that be a good indication for an AUS? Yes, so um, uh, AUS is appropriate for any patient or a patient with any severity of incontinence. So while that patient with mild to moderate incontinence may be a candidate for a sling, they are absolutely a candidate for AUS if they choose. Other than post prostatectomy, what indications are good for AUS? So uh, the guideline also, that's a great question. The guideline also states that post terp incontinence or post bladder outlet procedure incontinence should be treated as post-prostate treatment uh, incontinence. And I think that's why they left it uh, vague in the title. Um, so AUS is appropriate for patients who develop um, uh, incontinence after TERP. Now, I think SLING um, is in the guidelines. SLING is also uh, um, indicated for post-TERP incontinence, uh, although I think that that is a little bit more uh, of a stretch, just given the anatomic considerations. How soon do you uh, ex explant an infected AUS? Some people will do IV antibiotics first and then take out a few days later. Uh, so my preference is to uh, explant this as soon as I know that it is no longer going to uh, be helpful. Can you put the patient safely on antibiotics if the next time you can get them to the um, to the OR uh, is a couple days, that's absolutely fine. It's not an emergency unless it's an emergency. Um, but I usually take them out as soon as I recognize um, that it's, it's going to need to come out. That being said, I once had a patient that said, uh, yeah, I'll see you in three weeks, and they did just fine. Which site on the urethra has the highest success with AUS? So um, the guideline would indicate that you want to get into that kind of mid to proximal bulb. Um, and that's what I was indicating here. So placing an AUS where the crora split right here on that kind of mid to proximal bulb is the, is the proper landing zone. And that's why the committee said that they favor a perineal incision, like Dr. Nikolovsky made here, over a penoscrotal, where they feel you might be able to get the cuff down to where it's supposed to be if, if you expose appropriately, but there may be a tendency for the cuffs to kind of work their way, uh, or their cuffs not to, to find their way proximally, but find their way into a position uh, here. Um, and that might be why uh, continence is compromised. All right, how would you advise a patient with incontinence and history of non-muscle invasive bladder, bladder cancer? Um, I wonder if there's any way that somebody could unmute themselves and answer that question if somebody has more experience than I do. I have not had this. I would probably 
place the cuff because I am a quality of life guy. And I would say I would perform cysto uh, flexible cystoscopy through the cuff um, and uh, try to try to manage um, with fulguration. Um, so if anybody is still there who want care to unmute themselves and answer that question, I'd be appreciative. And with that, that is all I have. Thanks, Steve. Excellent talk. Very informative, uh, well designed. Appreciate you. Thank you. Time to do it. Yeah, good job. I like this Slido uh, interactive. I think that really made a big difference. Good. So uh, thank you all. Um, this will be recorded and up online shortly. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thanks, Dr. Blakely. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you.